Hi, everybody. This is such a strange and lovely <laughs> experience for me, in part um, because uh, I did grow up in Tudor City. I moved there when I was four, and I left when I was 12. So just <laughs> the kind of magical years you remember the place of childhood, uh, that's the place I remember best. And uh, also, all of this is strange for me because Carol remembers the decade I spent working on Celluloid Skyline. Before that, I spent another decade working on a history of residential housing and uh, architecture in New York, uh, a, a book in the drawer, so to speak, uh, with an ex-partner, and um, uh, thought a lot about these same issues. So, but it's a really, it's a spe special pleasure to come and talk about Tudor City in this wonderful, Nick has done, I think, a just fantastic job here. And, how do I do this? Like that? Yeah. Um, I titled my, my talk, You Can Have It All, The Lessons of Tudor City. And um, I'm not going to tell you a detailed history of Tudor City. Rather, I want to do, as I said, draw out the lessons. I believe uh, that the lessons of Tudor City are as valuable today as they have ever been. Now, there's nothing nostalgic about what I'm going to talk to you about. I believe Tudor City is an extraordinary model of urban development that could be built tomorrow in many ways, and uh, has so many of the values and reconciles so many of the seemingly um, oppositional issues of 20th century housing. Briefly, however, the project was built in the late 1920s. Um, it stretches from 43rd Street to 40th Street. Uh, it's built essentially around 43rd, 42nd, and 41st Street. It's built on a promontory uh, that runs parallel to the East River, um, it consists of three large apartment houses uh, along a what had been Prospect Place, then renamed Tudor Place. More apartment houses, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the differences. Additional buildings along 42nd Street um, and other smaller buildings around here. This is a view obviously looking east on 42nd Street. Uh, this was a not tenement district. These were basically built as row houses. They were, by that time, Tudor City was built with most of the less effective rooming houses. It was not considered an attractive part of New York, um, in part because the entire East River waterfront, what we now know as the site of the United Nations, was filled almost entirely with slaughterhouses. You can own, this was known, First Avenue was known as Blood Alley. You can imagine how wonderful that was. It leads to one of the strangest things about Tudor City, but an important formative thing about Tudor City, which is there are almost no views of the apartments to the east because nobody wanted to look or, more importantly, smell what was going on over there. So the entire complex almost entirely faces west. Um, and effectively, you might argue, what had to happen is that they had to create their own landscape, their own views, their own world by turning inward but they did it in a very, very interesting way. Um, this is um, what's called the hospital, I cannot make this up, for crippled and ruptured children. <laughs> and it uh, was torn down. I remember going to vote with my father in this hospital. Um, it later became the site of the Ford Foundation building. And uh, it was a massive undertaking, uh, one of the biggest projects that had happened in New York until that time. This beautiful drawing gives you a little feeling of the kind of heroic effort that was involved in building on this promontory. Basically, they tore down most but not all of the old townhouse buildings, uh, or row house buildings, and then, and then straddled what had been this opening, uh, streetcars coming and traffic coming through 42nd Street. This is an important shot because it explains really the entire premise of the project. There was a new massive center of New York City no one knows more about this than Carol Willis, that had just emerged. Wall Street had always been the center of New York, lower Manhattan, but starting around 1915, a rival had emerged in East Midtown around Grand Central Terminal with the newest and tallest uh, office buildings in New York going up in an incredible clip, and hotels, and clubs, and other buildings. And this was the new center of activity, and the notion was, what if we could have a residential community that where people could walk to their office buildings around uh, Grand Central Terminal. And in fact, that was a big part of the ad campaigns. You gain an hour of time. You do not have to take this, the number seven line all the way to Jackson Heights. You will have a whole new freedom. There was something else about the project, however, that is related to this, which was this has to do with the fact that the buildings were hotel buildings in part. Some of them were not. 
And I'd like to think of it in broader terms. This is, this is where Sex in the City starts. This is the new idea that there's a young, white collar, not particularly affluent, but definitely white collar. These are not factory workers. They work in these new office buildings. Maybe they're in advertising, other kinds of blue uh, white collar activities. They are young. They are not going to stay in New York long. They are here to be here, to meet someone, to get married, and to move out. And it's the kind of world of young New Yorkers, young, attractive, white collar New Yorkers. So you could say that sort of Sarah Jessica Parker land basically <laughs> is what these were built. We're going to talk about the small apartments and so forth. And so it went up amazingly quickly, within about four or five years, um, with these landscaped grounds. And this was uh, the, the, one of the three big buildings along what had been renamed Tudor City Place. And this was another major tower called the Woodstock in the center of the project. And um, you can see the architecture, we'll talk a bit about it, varied, it, but it, all of it had this kind of Tudor theme. This building obviously feels a little more like, like classical kind of Hugh Ferris setbacks. So I'm going, to propose, I'm going to present three propositions, urban design propositions, about the project. And I'm going to say them now, and then I'm going to bring them back at the very end as I tell you a little after I've told you a little bit about the project. My first proposition is that Tudor City contradicts what I believe is a false modernist dichotomy, that we must somehow choose between the values of vital and dense urban life on the one hand, or sunlight, ventilation, and greenery on the other. This was a fundamental schism of 20th century urbanism promulgated by Le Corbusier and everyone else that you had to, oops, I guess I will go back, um, that you had to choose somehow between fun, diverse, lively, vital, dense cities and a kind of vision of greenery. It wasn't really suburban, it wasn't about private ownership necessarily, but it was definitely about the idea of open space and sunlight and greenery and that those were the supreme values and all that other stuff had to make way for it. Gone with the shops, gone with the density, gone with the streets, all gone for this new vision. Proposition number two, that Tudor City, along with its contemporary, not often compared to, but I will argue very similar, offers an incredibly valuable alternative to the super block, the core idea of the modern redevelopment program. It's a multi-block development that retains the street grid, fits into the existing city, and instead uses consistent architecture to offer a reinvented urban environment across a large swath of the city. So it is neither a single building on a single lot, nor is it a modernist super block. It is something more intricate and complex that in my view combines the best aspects of large scale redevelopment that the super block offered with fine grain life that, and diversity and complexity that the traditional city offered and some other values I'll get to. Also like Rockefeller Center, proposition number three proposes, Tudor City adapts but reimagine and elevates the essential urbanism of New York. The basic sort of compact, you might say, of New York. Compact private spaces, which allow density and vitality, are compensated by gracious, extensive public spaces and stylish, urbane amenities. It's the basic deal you make when you move to New York or a city like New York. Your place of living is going to be smaller than it could be in the suburbs, but you will get all this kind of stuff that you will never get in the suburbs. You will get grants that you'll get uh, Central Park, and you'll get the East River, and you'll get the Brooklyn Bridge, and you'll get the lively streets, and the great shops, and the good places to eat. And uh, I think that what's brilliant about Twitter City is it takes that basic premise, that basic idea of why did you move to New York in the first place, and, and refines it, and elevates it, and makes it all that it could be. Um, the plan is really interesting. Basically, French and his partners bought up uh, a lot of properties, as I say, not all of them. They took advantage of this pre-existing street, but really remade it um, in, their, in their sort of own image. The three great towers are here, here, and here. The Windsor, the Tudor, and the Prospect. You could hold a gun to my head, and I would never forget these. The Manor, the Hermitage, and the, the Cloisters up at the top. Um, and some of the other buildings here, I won't go into all of them. I grew up in Two Tudor City Place, which was a later addition to the project, um, where there had been located uh, some tennis courts that we're going to actually see. And as you see, First Avenue was here, Second Avenue here. Remember, Second Avenue has an elevated line running on this 
when it's built. So you don't really want to be on that much too much either. Um, but they're basically creating two large parks with actually, in those days, a little central area park as well. Now, just one of the fantastic things about Tudor City as a model for urban development is it mixes an amazing diversity of incomes, of, of apartments. Basically, the three big massive uh, apartment houses had very inexpensive, very small studio and one bedroom apartments for, with this kind of hotel, for those young, youngins, the ones who are 23, 24 years old, getting their first jobs out of school. The buildings along the north side and some along the south side later as well were more uh, bigger apartments for families, more expensive and larger and appropriate for families. And finally, up at the top of these huge apartments, of these huge buildings, they built some spectacular upper end apartments, just everything you would ever dream of living in New York. So very quietly and without much fuss, they're mixing the rich, the middle class, and the not poor exactly, but sort of up, up and coming, um, certainly modest in, in, their, in their, uh, their, their uh, income levels. And they're doing it just, it's just creating kind of a diverse urban environment. They're not separating people. There's no poor door. There's nothing like that. It just does it. It just brings the diversity of the city together. Here, I'll go through it with you. These are the kind of apartments in the big apartment houses. These were the famous small apartments of Tudor City. I always remember we lived in a rather large modern apartment and I always remember visiting all my friends. But yes, you and two other girls could live here. And um, what was famous, uh, and you can see the sort of compact proportions, they do the old, old interior designer trick of having a mirrored surface to make it look a little bigger. But you see very large windows and very well ventilated. There are a lot of air and light. What was sort of notorious about them was that they had no kitchen. They had these funny little service pantries, which of course makes all the sense in the world if you think of it as a hotel, but was really an issue. It was kind of funny. And I grew up with, by the time I lived there in the early 60s, there were families, real families living there, and poor, those poor moms in those days trying to make family meals in this little tiny kitchenette, this little service pantry. I mean, it was sort of dreamy for, you sort of imagine the, the martini shaker and the sort of Nick and Nora, you know, let's. Let's have martinis. But, um, but that was an issue for those apartments. But it kept the size of them very small and allowed them to achieve these really pretty amazing densities. We asked Leo to calculate the densities. And we came up with, uh, what was the number? It was incredible. 1,203 people per acre, if you count only the private property. OK, so that's not really, I mean, the built thing. That's not fair. You have to count the streets, and you have to count the parks, because in a suit. Parks are counted in the 1,200. The 1,200, but not the streets. Street. Okay, so that's pretty impressive right there. Add in the streets, and you're still at almost 787, at almost 800, which is easily comparable. I want to kind of go back to this slide. Easily comparable to the Knickerbocker Village or to uh, London, Terrace. London Terrace. With, however, I would like to make an extremely important point. <laughs> Have you ever been inside London Terrace or Knickerbocker Village? Those are nice, and those courtyards are not nice places to be. They are, you're at the bottom of a swimming pool. They are dark, they are compressed and unpleasant, and they don't get much sunlight. They do serve the sort of technical needs of what they're, what they're supposed to do, but I would never want to hang out there. The parts of Tudor City are always lighted, always sunlit on the coldest day. They are always pleasant places to sit. They are broad and spacious and wonderful. So ha that has to be remembered. If you want to compare it in the other way to a NYCHA project, typical polo grounds is 268 people per acre. So this is three times the density all right, of a NYCHA project. Moving on, um, talking about those magnificent, so it was one of the kind of wonderful other ideas of. Of, of, of Tudor City that, okay, you had this huge shaft, we're gonna have this kind of wonderful top, a la Beaux-Arts kind of tripartite design, but this isn't just an ornamental top, they put in these fantastic apartments up here, and this whole fantasy land of rooftop gardens and spaces, which created a kind of, it was one of the things you bought, it was that idea, you know, when we talk about kind of public space and the value of public space, it isn't just literally the parks, it isn't just the places to, to, to be. It's the, the public collective imagination 
And this gave you a kind of a vision of fantasy. You would walk to your house every day and you'd look up, as I did when I would go to sleep, to these amazing spires and, and this incredible landscape. And in fact, these astonishing duplex, get ready, duplex apartments, which are still there, are now getting many millions of dollars a piece. One of my childhood memories, do you, re do you remember some awful cologne called Hawaii? And what was it called? Her Kara High Karate. And I watched High Karate Commercial, which is still available, by the way, on the web, being photographed in this very apartment uh, from the balcony. Um, but look at that. Kind of a, could, you, could there be any dreamier idea of the way you might live in New York and what, you know, what New York was about? Okay, we didn't go to these apartments all the time, but they were there, and we knew they were there, and they were part of our world. Also, it created this incredible, collective, amazing environment on, on several of the buildings of uh, uh, sunning areas, which were used, very, very well used, and you can see here, with these kind of magnificent views, and the kind of getting a double benefit of the kind of wonderful architecture now seen from the inside, sort of giving you this special frame, and also, by the way, making you feel totally comfortable to be there on the roof and not like you were gonna fall off. But of course, the pride of Tudor City was its parks, and is its parks. These astonishing public spaces, these, these landscape gardens that were out every window that you could see from almost any apartment, which were both very large and impressive in scale, and beautifully detailed, and beautifully thought through. And of course, think of the value that they gave. First of all, they framed the apartment houses. You could look back. Everything Corbusier complained about in New York. You would never see the buildings because you couldn't stand back. Well, here you could you could actually see that wonderful architecture from in a way that almost very rarely, certainly in Manhattan, you get the opportunity to do full frontal, looking from a beautiful space. And of course, second value, they added to the value of the apartments because you look down on these marvelous gardens. It was incredible. Instead of the typical New York, and this is why, by the way, my father moved us here. He said he hated that. He said no matter how much money you spend in Manhattan, you still just seem to see a building across the street unless you literally live in a penthouse. Whereas here, every apartment, every single apartment in this complex had this view, just about, maybe a couple. Of them. And they went beyond that. There was certainly in the early days of the project a kind of notion of, um, a kind of above and beyond elegance of the landscaping. Beautifully <laughs> landscaped, beautifully trimmed with a whole kind of fancy environment uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not ever, uh, what would be the word, cynical about this sort of thing. I mean, sure, it's, is it kind of absurd that there's a Tudor-style little cottage in the middle of Manhattan in 1931? Sure. But you know what? It's fantastic. And it worked beautifully. And it was a beautifully, fully conceived and elegantly designed and exquisitely detailed so that there was a kind of a, uh, when you grew up there, there was kind of a feeling of living in the most precious place. There were also kind of fascinating and allowed for kind of all sorts of fascinating specialty things. Okay, the tennis courts didn't last. My building replaced them in 1956, but there they were. And by the way, they had some serious, apparently serious seated tennis players playing there in the 1950s. This, however, I remember very well. This was, I should point out, looking at the park. The parks were differentiated. There was the grown even when I was a kid. The grown-ups park and the kids park. The South Park was the grown-ups park. And you can see it was laid out much more as a kind of formal garden, much more a park for seeing and observing and being. And the North Park was the more active park, and that was the children's park. And in the children's park was the children's playground, which they had actually sort of put in an area, kind of recessed and used, I guess, this wall. I'm not sure if it had been built for this, but they took advantage of it so that the noise of the children didn't disturb people beyond it. And they had this, all this. I must say, when I was a kid, this had no, was no longer found. It was a sandbox. But I remember it well. It's where I spent my time. And there was another thing about the parks. True to this day, that they, they did provide classically the social and community centers so hard to achieve in New York. The dream, I think, of those housing projects almost never achieved in the housing project. But this really worked because this really was like the embrace of the buildings around the Central Park, parks that everyone looked at, you walked out your door, there they were, and they were the thing you shared with everybody else. And whether it was the Christmas tree that was lighted every day, every uh, Christmas in the South Park, or events and parties, and, and they, 
I looked in the histories, they used to have a dance thing. There were all kinds of programming. Some of that's gone by the way, but they still have the Christmas tree, and this was taken maybe a year ago. This, it's still a place where people come together and get to know their neighbors. That's a pretty nice value. There was a kind of wonderful, that carried the, the theme, the, the Tudor theme, to absurd but absolutely wonderful lengths. That, this are the, the street fronts. So, so this is another point. I mean, you can kid about like all this kind of stuff, and it was kind of wonderful. By the way, it says it was built by Fred French here. That's what Fred French. And there were these uh, something about there was a they found a, a Hessian sword when they were excavating for this building, <laughs> which was I guess true. Um, so beyond the whimsy of the project, I want to point out that there was enormous attention paid to the streetscape. So even though there was this greenery and this concept of green, the streets were real streets and the sidewalks were real sidewalks. And Tudor City Place was a real and wonderful street to walk down. And as you walked, there were, it was full of incident, um, and still is, these kind of wonderful Gothic uh, trefoils and things like that. And here you get the feeling as you walk down the street, um, it is not a dull and boring walk. Uh, it has incident and variety and all the qualities that we would love in a, let's say, Fifth Avenue apartment house, um, including, you know, planting out front and, and so forth. Except, once again, remember, this was, for, this was affordable housing. Now, of course, one of, the, one of the other qualities I want to point out to, it was urbane. This was another thing that got lost in the modernist epoch. The idea of urbanity, the idea that city was something more than a lot of people living in the same place with a kind of, kind of a functional, mechanistic idea. The idea that there were possibilities to urban life, that there was an excitement to urban life, that urban life had a kind of wonderful magical quality that couldn't be achieved in lower density places, sort of went away. And in fact, in the case of NYCHA, was actively discouraged. I mean, you just have to face it. They, they only with the greatest reluctance, put shops on the edge of their projects. They did not like the idea of shops. They did not like the idea of street life. Uh, they, it was the old things of the kids hanging out in the street corners and everything Jane Jacobs later, later criticized about them as that was true. Tudor City was urbane. I've shown you in some of the other images. But of course, one of the reasons it was urbane was it had a lot of places to eat and drink. It had to because those apartments didn't have any kitchens. So it had to have, think of it as a hotel, right? So you go downstairs, except here, instead of being the lobby of the hotel with, with some nice bars and restaurants, it was a city of bars and restaurants. Where shall we go? That is um, from there. There were a variety, again, very thoughtful, very uh, alert to both sort of, let's call it social and class differences but also urban possibilities. So there was, a, there was a coffee hat that was pretty inexpensive, and then there was kind of a, a mid-range restaurant, which was still there when I was a kid, now Limpero, a um, very fancy place. Fantastic bar, I guess, you know, looks like out of an ocean liner. And again, this is the idea not only that there, you might, different groups of people with different budgets might want different kinds of places to eat, but also that on a given on a Friday night, you might want to go out and have a more fancier experience than you have on a Tuesday. And again, what the attraction of the city is. Summed up for me in this beautiful drawing. We saw it a little earlier, but I wanted to blow it up. And this kind of magical idea. Nowhere except New York, right? I mean, it's urban, it's high rise, it's skyscrapers, really. These are steel frame, 20 something story. I've forgotten exactly how story buildings but with this kind of wonderful offset by this, these beautiful gardens. Okay, maybe a little romanticized here with this, but still not unlike my actual memories of this place in the evening. So I want to come back to and open up just, to, and, and we'll end with this, this thing, opening up the, the false schism. You know, the idea that it had to be, like this was the version of the basically the, the drawing that Carol showed, except this is an actual photograph of the Lower East Side when fully a million people lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, you can imagine. And the idea that sure, the streets are bustling, the streets are dense. No, because look at the backyards. There are no backyards. This is from Dead End, that's Sylvia said, filming. But the idea that of course there's no other place for life to go. There's no healthful thing. So you have to have this vitality, but at what cost? You know, the terrible loss. 
And that somehow, if you didn't have that, you had to have this. You had to have all the, the street grid, everything pulled away, a field of greenery, repetitive slab towers placed on a field of greenery with no streets, no sidewalks, no shops, no you know, different times of day uses. And more importantly though, a kind of idea that, you know, the new man will live here. You know, the new improved man and woman of tomorrow. You had to live up to this bloody thing. You had to be part of, they didn't give you any of the old things that you loved about New York. You had to be the new 20th century man. And I would argue that Tudor City puts that completely, sees that for the idiocy that it is. Why can't you have all the greenery that you would have in, a, in any NYCHA housing project and have a lovely streetscape with urban life and lovely shops and all the things that you want out of, a, out of city life? It's an absurd schism, and I think, it's, I think Tudor City is one of the grandest, sort of, um, it revokes it in the grandest possible way. Uh, premise two about Rockefeller Center. It's, they're not often there, but to me they're fascinatingly same. Even the, you know, the homeliness of Tudor City compared to the elegance and sophistication of Rockefeller Center. But urbanistically, they are almost identical. They are neither super block projects that wipe away the city, nor are they one by one by one little houses on a lot with the existing grid. They take the grid, they confront it, they remake it, they rethink it, but they do not lose it. They keep it. They improve it. They add a, They not only take the traditional streets, which pass right through them, without any problem. Somebody once said, or maybe it was me, you you can walk right through the projects without having to do anything. You don't have to become a new kind of person. It doesn't expect or ask anything of you. It's just good old New York. Side streets going through. Just walk right through. If you find something nice while you do it, that's great. But you're not expected to become a new person. It actually improves and makes finer grain that grain by adding a new street. Okay, in Tudor City there was this existing street, but they treated it in this beautiful way, not unlike the way Rockefeller Center did, with built, you know, with lots of built fabric surrounding surrounding an open space. And so, um, so it strikes me that the projects are extraordinary, and the value of the idea. Well, one final point: it it's it holds together. It's a thing, it's a place, it's Rockefeller Center, it's Tudor City. But it doesn't insist on doing that in this dumb-headed way of wiping away everything else. It lets this fine-grained urban thing go through it, and then it uses architecture to remake the environment. So you know, even though I said, sure, you could just walk through it and it doesn't ask anything of you, you certainly know when you're walking through Rockefeller Center, and you certainly know when you're walking through Tudor City. A couple of other interesting implications of that. One is, you can integrate the past or the future very easily. They didn't ha you didn't have to tear down the old, old houses. They just sat there perfectly nicely in relationship. This was an old, this was empty my whole childhood. It was the haunted house <laughs> when I was a kid. And it's one of the old pre-existing uh, row houses that French wasn't able to get his hands on. But no problem, it just sits there. So, you know, there's a kind of fine grain intersection with the, with the existing city that is not catastrophic. Um, and finally, uh, you know, coming back to this point, you know, this basic idea to me, it's, it's taking the basic idea that we all live with and that we all exist, the small apartment, but really going, hey, what if we really thought, rethought the possibilities of every level of urban life? Think of that rooftop sunning and those wonderful apartments and think of those parks and all the other, and that little pool, and these amazing, this amazing level of detail. And, and this is not a minor rethinking of New York City. This is a significant rethinking of New York City and what its opportunities is, are, as is this. There's nothing lack of ambition here. Um, it's as dramatic in its way as any super block housing project. It's simply done in a way that uh, just allows the city to breathe and allows you to be part of it. And, recaptures and reimagines everything that we already love about cities. Thanks very much.